A reading from the book of Exodus. Thus says the Lord, you shall not molest or oppress the alien, for you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. You shall not wrong any widow or orphan. If you ever wrong them, they will cry out to me. I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will flare up and I will kill with the sword, kill you with the sword. Then your own wives will be widows and your children orphans. If you lend money to one of your poor neighbors among my people, you shall not act as an extortioner toward them by demanding interest from them. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you shall return it to him before sunset, for his cloak is the only covering he has for his body. What else shall he sleep in? If he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. The word of the Lord. From the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, brothers and sisters, you know what sort of people we were among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became a model for all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves openly declare about us what reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God 
and to await his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him, him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you would agree with me when I say that it is in Christianity the easiest thing in, these, in this invitation that Jesus gives us and the most difficult thing all at the same time. It's not an either-or combination. It's a sense of love is what it is all about. Not the love of the car or the house or your bank check or what's in your bank account or anything like that because my sisters and brothers, at the end of the day, none of that is important. What is truly important is that you love the gift that you have been given, which is your own life because no one else can live that life. You have been given and you are made in the image and likeness of God. So the first thing is, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, you can't do that and you can't love anybody else if you don't love the gift of yourself. And that is a healthy ego thing. I'm not talking about unhealthy, egotistical people. I'm talking about loving what the DNA that your parents give you and the way that you were brought into the world with your face, your love, your body, the wholeness of you. The invitation is to love out of that reality. Yesterday I baptized a little boy who uh, is Mexican and half black beautiful child. Uh, he was three years old. He's on the spectrum with a single mother. And she came, she didn't want mass in front of everybody because we usually baptize in mass. Um, and I said, of course, there are lots of rules and regulations in the Catholic Church about who, what, where, when, and how. 
But all I wanted to do was love her, love her little kid. And when he was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, as we all are, what do you want for this child, this beautiful child? You want everything that could possibly be for him. You want him to grow up to be loved, to love himself, even in his on the spectrum that he clearly is? Will he be loved and get what he needs to flourish? Will the community and the family love him? Will the color of his skin make a difference? Will who he is and not the content of his character be most important? Because at the end of the day, that is what is most important. I give thanks to God all my life for my grandmother. My parents are in heaven going, my mom especially wouldn't like what I'm about to say. But my grandmother lost her own parents, eldest of five girls at 18, in an accident in a hotel in Belfast in the 20s, 30s. My great-grandfather had put his coat, they'd gone to see uh, attorneys and they'd put their coat on what he thought was a coat hanger in the bedroom of the hotel, and actually it was the lever for a gas light. So they both lost their lives. And my grandmother then had to uh, bring up her four sisters, and I was just about to get married, and you can imagine the tiny little house that they all grew up in. But I have, since I've met Mexicans, Latino people from the South, Italy, Spain, Portugal, I should have been born in Italy, Spain, or Mexico, or somewhere south, because my grandmother was the most affectionate woman, and is not particularly Irish to be very affectionate, and it's a very unfortunate thing. But for me, it's always been a great joy to be an affectionate person, a person who easily feels and don't care what anybody else thinks or feels. And so that has been difficult as I've gone through life, but also has been a tremendous sense of joy, especially as a priest for me. But today, the invitation in the Gospels is difficult to love that gift within yourself. I cannot emphasize that. I'll tell you in the confession, although I could sit in St. Columba, there are no sinners at St. Columba. Saturday afternoon, I sit in that confession box and nobody shows up, so they must all be very holy and I must be doing a wonderful job. <laughs> but sometimes when people come in, you know, they have a long list of stuff of what, what's in their lives. But my question is, do you love you? You can always tell when somebody doesn't really love themselves because they pause and they wait a minute and then eventually, yes, because it's maybe the right thing to say. But you can pretty much tell. And then that becomes the subject of the confession because then I tell them, go out into the world and love yourself before you can love anyone else. So we're called to love God. And in these days, we are called to do that through Mother Church. That first reading, ladies, do you think, who wrote that reading? <laughs> guys. It was guys that wrote it. Men wrote that reading. No woman would write that, at least the first part of it, the whole war thing. Women are in there because they bring the compassion and the love. Women are always shaping things. They may not be out front. But today in the gospel, we look at our own church and the invitation that's happening right now under Pope Francis. My sisters and brothers, this is not new. Francis is not doing something new. He is bringing something from our 2,000 year tradition where we sit down at round tables. We are not hierarchical and we let everybody speak. We're into the business of deep listening. We've got two ears. We need to listen twice as much to the depth and the reality. And Francis brought in 90 non-voting, uh, or not bishops, 
and half of those are women. Now, if I was the Pope, think about that for a minute, <laughs> uh, I would have made, they have 350 bishops, they should have had 350 lay people. And half of those should have been women. I'm absolutely convinced after watching every single one of the uh, press conferences that the Vatican had, the joy with which cardinals, bishops, women, men, everybody said, because everybody said the same thing, I felt heard. I felt that my voice was heard. I felt equal. And so even Francis sat at a round table. It is an invitation to have already since a couple of years ago, and we all got a chance to say what we think and feel. At St. Columba, we sent in our submission to the Diocese of Oakland, but just in case our bishop and those people down at the, at the Chancery office might change what we were saying, we sent our copy also to the Vatican. <laughs> you also have to be smart with the head and happy with the feet that dance. You have to be able to do both things. And so, in this moment in time, I feel, I'm filled with great joy because I am absolutely convinced we have hurt ourselves as a church by not allowing women to have an equal part all the way from baptism through the entire church. Amen? Amen. And each woman brings, think about what women do to bring about that nourishing, maternal, smart, wonderful gift that they have. And just because there are some that think, and if you watch EWTN, I'm telling you, my sisters and brothers, it is not the mouthpiece of the Catholic Church in these United States. They are funded not by the church, but by a very right-wing understanding of church stuck somewhere in 1950. And you have to understand that whatever channel you're watching or whatever silo you're in, whoever pays the piper is giving you the information. And they have attacked Francis over and over and over again. And if we don't have the papacy, then we don't have our unity. So it is just wrong. They're not listening to the voice and the heart of the church. Everybody in the Catholic Church, 1.4 billion, got to have their say. Everybody got to have their say, and that was collated and sent to the Vatican. And now these 400 and something people concluded yesterday, it is not over. They have a document and a letter that's going out. But in the next year, they have to go off and do some deep listening. It's not A or B. It could be H, J, Z. It could be any other on all of the topics, and they brought together all that they have agreed upon, and then the other stuff that they're going off to pray about it all, and come back next year. But we must be a church that listens. Young people are not coming to the church because we're not, we're not dancing the dance, we're not speaking the word. The two things have to be connected. We have to be the loving church that we need to be. In terms of human, humanity, look at, read the DSM-5. Read all of the stuff that's happening for our modern understanding of psychology, our spirituality, medical science. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit. She has given us all this modern stuff. So you can't be back in 1950 with an understanding of that science and that place, we must always be a church that's always in need of reform and understanding and informing us of the totality of who we are. So we must be fully functioning, alive human beings that come with our brains, with our hearts, our sexuality, everything about us. And the church must understand that and engage that reality, because Jesus is the ultimate example of humanity. It didn't stop somewhere. It never stopped somewhere. We must always engage the gift of ourselves, challenge the gift of ourselves. And we cannot, like last Sunday's 
gospel be trapped. They try to trap Jesus. This is a moment where he's telling us as he heads to the cross, this is how it is to be a disciple. You have to be awake and alive. Don't get caught up in the word woke. Woke existed before ever there was. It got hijacked in the current understanding of it. You have to be awake, woke, alive to the reality of our lives. Last Sunday, you were, Jesus was being trapped. Have you ever felt trapped in your life by anything that's ever happened to you? God is the God of the trapee, not the trapper. We are called to be liberated and loved in the best way that we can. And so, as we look over into the Middle East right now, I was there last for my sabbatical last year, and I took the bus. The people at the Vatican Institute I was staying at, all of them, mostly Muslims, said, don't go to Ramallah. Well, when somebody tells me I shouldn't do something, then that makes me more inclined to want to do it. So Saturday morning, I got on the bus with all of this. There's two bus systems in Jerusalem for Muslims and Jews. I got on the Muslim bus, went into town. I'm sure they're wondering who this white guy is getting on the bus. And then we went through all of these different checkpoints. And then I got to Ramallah to visit with my friend. This guy was the father of two little boys, single father. This man was one of the most beautiful spirits I've ever met. He was my brother's friend in college in London. And my brother gave me his information. And I WhatsApped him and said, I want to come and visit you. He told me at that minute he feared for his two little teenage boys. He said the whole thing is a powder keg ready to go off at any minute for how you treat people. Hurt people hurt people. And yes, the Jewish people have been hurt, but my sisters and brothers, to be against Zionism is not anti-Jewish. There are loads of Jews in the world who don't necessarily think it's a good idea to go and take that piece of land and, and kill and maim and push other people out. And the people in Gaza have been, and I don't want anybody to hear that I'm saying it was a good thing or condone what happened by Hamas. I am not saying that. But to cut off water, to cut off food, to cut off electricity, these, this is the basics of human life is just wrong. And we must untrap these people. We must call for a ceasefire. We must love the people in the world. And we must, as the United States, as the policemen of the world, also have a responsibility to love on those people, minimally pray about it. We are called in our lives to be the best that we can be. And the invitation is, love yourself enough and be discreet enough and smart enough to think through what you're hearing and what you're being told, be, be it church or state and in your own life. So that at the end of the day, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is everybody I encounter. And that, my sisters and brothers, is a tall order. It is so easy to love. And it is so difficult to love at the same time. So let us journey together towards the end of this year of grace, 2023, that's coming to a quick conclusion with the Feast of Christ the King. Let that feast be a way of informing us and making us anew for the feast that is the year of grace, 2024. May it be a new year. May we be more in love with ourselves, our community, and our world. And may we be the people that Christ calls us to be. Amen. Amen. Amen.